Hello medicals, good day to all of you. So today I will be discussing about the female reproductive organs, mainly the ovary, uterus and the uterine tubes. So our learning objectives for ovary will be a short introduction about this uh, female gonad then followed by that its situation where it is situated and uh, its measurements followed by that peritoneal coverings presenting parts such as external features ends surfaces borders then the arterial supply venous drainage lymphatic drainage and uh, finally the clinical aspects. Now with respect to the ovary which we are seeing here, it is the female gonad, so homologous to the testis, which produces the female gametes, the ova or you can take it as the ovum but the, it actually does not uh, produce a what do you call a mature ovum the complete maturation of the ovum takes place just before the fertilization otherwise it is released at the second meiotic division it is arrested in the second meiotic division and then the ovum is discharged uh, through the menstrual bleeding. So mainly it produces the oocytes and uh, it is also an endocrine organ because it produces estrogen and progesterone. So progesterone is mainly responsible for uh, maintenance of the pregnancy whereas estrogen is the female primary hormone which is responsible for maintaining the proper ovulation. Uh, menstruation and uh, expression of secondary sexual characters. So it is also an endocrine organ. Roughly it is almond shaped and uh, slate greyish color. Only in prepubertal that is before the onset of mena the surface will be smooth. But once the onset of puberty from menarche, the surface becomes irregular because during every monthly cycle, the surface is ruptured to release the oocyte along with the follicles. That is the supporting sense. So it is roughly 3 to 4 centimeters in length and uh, the breadth is 2 centimeters and the thickness is just 1 centimeter. And the axis is directed vertically, it is not as we see in this picture. The upper end is actually called as the tubal end, which is related to the uterine tube, and the lower end will be related to the uterus, so it is called as the uterine end. So the upper end is directed somewhat upwards and laterally. It is situated in the lesser pelvis, so immediately below the inlet of the pelvis just below the pelvic brim it is situated in the lesser pelvis in the adult nulliparous or multiparous adult women and in children it is situated above the pelvic brim it is situated above just above the pelvic brim still it has not uh, come to the lesser pelvis or two pelvis in case of the children and in multiparous women due to repeated pregnancies the ovary might get prolapsed into the recto uterine pouch most commonly where an uh, prolapsed ovary is seen is the recto uterine pouch the pouch which is present between the posterior surface of the uterus and the rectum okay so this should be your pelvic brim and the 
pelvic muscles, lateral wall of the pelvic muscles which are actually converging to form the pelvic diaphragm. Okay. So, the lateral surface is related to the pelvic wall and uh, even though it is situated in the lesser pelvis, the ovary is a intraperitoneal organ, it is covered by peritoneum okay. and uh, the uterine tube has to pierce an opening in the peritoneum and then it comes to lie near the ovary. So, that is why in females the peritoneal cavity is an open cavity. So, through the ostium of the uterine tube it communicates with the exterior. Now, apart from the prolapsed ovary, ectopic ovary, ovary which is found elsewhere other than a, its normal position or situation is an ectopic ovary. Again, it can be seen in the recto uterine pouch or it can be seen somewhere in the inguinal canal or also very rarely in the labium mages. So, it could have descended uh, apart from its normal position. Now, ovary like testis also starts its descent. So, in the testis class we would have discussed about the descent of testis, testis which is produced uh, actually in the lumbar region posterior abdominal wall and then it starts its descent. Same way the ovary also commences its descent but further beyond it cannot descend because of the two paramesonephric ducts which is forming your uterine tubes, they fuse in the midline to form the uterus and the upper part of the vagina. So, that is why it starts its descent from the lumbar region, but it is finally situated in the lesser pelvis. Now, coming to the presenting parts of the ovary, the ovary has got two ends, the upper end is actually called as the tubal end. So, the ends are also called as the pores and the lower end is actually called as the uterine end. So, two ends, tubal end and the uterine end two borders, anterior border is also called as the mesoderian border, posterior border is free and it is and this is actually the posterior border, this is the anterior border, we are actually viewing the ovary from behind. Now front we have the urinary bladder, this is posterior surface of the uterus and this fan shaped large fold is the broad ligament. So this is the posterior surface or the posterior layer of the broad ligament to which the uterus is related intimately. So, anterior border is related to the uh, posterior layer of the broad ligament and it is called as the mesoverian border. Posterior border is free and this is your tubal end and uterine end and it has two surfaces. This surface which is facing the uterus is the medial surface and we have the lateral surface which is related to the lateral wall of the pelvis. Okay. So, these are the presenting parts of the ovary. So, now let us try to understand the presenting parts one by one. Now, first the tubal end is mainly related to the fimbriae of the uterine tube, ovarian fimbriae. So, this leaf-like process is actually called as the fimbriae of the uterine tube. One of the fimbriae is very long and it is situated very intimately to the ovary or touches the ovary, it is called as the ovarian fimbriae. It is called as the ovarian fimbriae. So, the fimbriae <coughs> is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium. So, through its contractions, what happens is the ovary which releases the oocyte is by the suction action of this uh, uterine tube, it enters into it. So, actually the oocyte is released into the peritoneum and uh, from there what happens through transylomic migration, the oocyte is transported via the uterine tube into the uterus. The process of release of oocyte is actually called as ovulation. Ovulation is different from menstruation. 
Menstruation is actually shedding of the uterine endometrium, the functional layer of the uterine endometrium which is characterized by discharge, uh, menstrual bleeding. Okay. So mainly it is related to the fibrae of the uterine tube and one of the fibrae is very long, it is called as the ovarian fibrae. Then the upper end cubelet is also related to the suspensory ligament of ovary which connects the upper end of the ovary and the uterine tube to the lateral pelvic wall. It is called as the suspensory ligament and uh, it is also called as infundibulopelvic ligament. It is also called as infundibulopelvic ligament. You can see the ovarian arteries and of course the plexus of veins. Uh, running in this suspensory ligament of ovary which contains the ovarian vessels and the ampliform plexus of veins. So mainly this is called as the suspensory ligament of ovary which anchors the ovary and the uterine tube to the lateral pelvic wall and transmits the ovarian vessels. The next end what we are seeing is the uterine end you are able to see here. The uterine end is again connected via a ligament which is called as the ligament of ovary from the lower end of the ovary to the lateral angle of the uterus. Okay. So here the uterus presents two angles or cornua, cornua means horn like where three structures are attached. One which we are able to see here is the ligament of ovary, the other one is the uterine tube and the more anteriorly which is not seen in this view is the round ligament of the uterus. So mainly uterine end is attached to the lateral angle of the uterus by the ligament of ovary. This is ligament of ovary, this is actually suspensory ligament of ovary or the infundibulopelvic uh, ligament. Coming to the borders, as I told you, two borders are there. This is the anterior border or the mesovarian border related to the posterior layer of the broad ligament. Okay. As I told you, we are viewing the posterior surface of the uterus and the posterior layer of the broad ligament. This is also called as mesovarian border where the transition of epithelium takes place because this broad ligament is a peritoneal fold which is lined by mesothelium. From there what happens is the uterus, sorry, the ovary is actually lined by cuboidal epithelium. So the transition of a mesothelium to the cuboidal epithelium or called as germinal epithelium, that line of transition is actually called as the white line of fur. It is actually called as the white line of fur. This ovarian border related to the posterior layer of broad ligament and through this only the uterine vessels which we have seen coming from the infundibulopelvic ligament or the suspensory ligament of ovary then through this anterior border enters the ovary. So anterior border serves as the hilum of ovary through which the ovarian vessels nerves, lymphatics enter or leave the ovary. Okay. White line of fur is the epithelial transition which I have just explained shortly. The next uh, is the posterior border of the ovary. The posterior border of the ovary will be again related to the uterine tube which you are able to see here. Upper part of the posterior border will be related to the uterine tube. This should be your suspensory ligament. Now, deep to that, more posteriorly, posterior to the uterine tube, here you are able to see this part is related to the posterior border of ovary, which is your internal iliac vessels and the ureter. So, this is your almond iliac which is dividing into external iliac and that is the internal iliac. So internal iliac artery and the ureter which is on its way 
to the urinary bladder as in the pelvic brim so here it is related to the posterior border of the womb so posterior border related to the uterine tube upper part of the posterior border related to the uterine tube and more posteriorly you see the internal iliac artery and the ureter the entire ovary is as i told you is a intraperitoneal organ covered by the peritoneum and attached to the broad ligament mesovarium so through the mesovarium or the anterior border it is attached to the posterior layer of broad ligament of the uterus okay so the uterine tubes actually pierces this ostium it is almost 3 mm in diameter so this part the uterine tube they pierces and they come to lie near the ovary medial surface so the medial surface is actually again related to the terminal part of the uterine tube so the uterine tube almost is related to the ovary tubal end upper part then we have seen on the posterior border then we have seen also on the medial surface so the medial surface only what happens is the last fibrillated part you can see the termination of the uterine tube it is separated from the uterine tube ovary this part of the ovary is separated from the uterine tube by a bursa ovarica a small recess peritoneal recess between the ovary and the mesosalpings mesosalpings is the fold or part of the broad ligament which invests the uterine tubes okay the uterine tube is invested in a fold of broad ligament which is actually called as the mesosalpings now looking at the lateral surface so ovary actually rests on the lateral surface on a fossa which is actually called as the ovarian fossa lined by the peritoneum so this ovary is resting on this ovarian fossa lined by peritoneum so deep to the peritoneum above you can see the external iliac vein and then above after the external iliac vein behind you can see the ureter and the division of this internal iliac artery okay internal iliac artery and ureter which forms the posterior border of the iliac fossa above what you see is the external iliac vein above and in front it can be called more above you will have the obliterated umbilical artery obliterated umbilical artery these are actually the boundaries of ovarian fossa and it is lined by peritoneum the floor of the fossa is actually lined by peritoneum and deep to the peritoneum you have obturator nerves and vessels so deep to the peritoneum what you have obturator nerve and vessels and more deeper or more laterally you go you have the the lateral wall of the pelvis muscles on the lateral wall the levator and a muscle which you can see okay so these are the boundaries of ovarian fossa one thing which you have to remember is on the lateral wall deep to the peritoneum you have the obturator nerve accompanied with the obturator vessels so blood supply mainly by ovarian artery which is a branch of abdominal aorta so it reaches to the suspensory ligament and then enters the ovary through the mesovarian border or the anterior border then apart from that also branches from the uterine artery which is a branch of anterior division of internal iliac artery so both these they anastomose so mainly it is from the ovarian artery and from the branches from the uterine artery which is a branch of anterior division of internal iliac artery veins papillary form plexus same like testis and finally they form two veins they unite to form a single vein right vein drains into the inferior vena cava and left vein 
left ovarian vein drains into the left renal vein. Lymphatics drain into preaortic lymph nodes and also into the lateral aortic nodes. So they mainly they drain into the preaortic and lateral aortic nodes. Sympathetics from T10 to T11 segments of the spinal cord. Parasympathetic is through spinous splanchnic nerves S2, S3, and S4. Sympathetics mainly they are vasomotor and uh, they also carry some pain sensations, visceral pain. So T10 to T11, so T10 spinal segment is also innervating the skin of the umbilicus. So referred pain, ovarian pain also is referred on the umbilicus because of its the segmental innervation for both the umbilicus and the ovary is the same. So inflammation of the ovary referred pain around the inner side of thigh and knee and around umbilicus. Now the referred pain in inner side of thigh and knee is because as I told you ovarian fossa, the lateral wall, obturator nerve. So it might irritate the obturator nerve, it supplies the inner side of the thigh and also the knee joint. So especially in women above middle age, 40-45 years of women, if they complain about uh, inner side pain over the inner side of thigh and the medial part of the knee then an examination of the ovary and the uterine tubes should also be made. Then around the umbilicus is because sympathetic T10 segment pain sensation so naturally umbilicus also has the same segments. Ovarian teratoma. So teratoma is disorganized growth of the germ layers. So most commonly it is seen germ layers disorganized growth of tissue which contains the germ layers in the ovary which is called as the ovarian teratoma. Kuchenberg's tumor is secondary metastasis of cancer or spread of cancer into the ovary. So mainly cancers of the breast secondaries can spread into the ovary, uterus, liver that is because the subdiaphragmatic plexus which drains the lower part of the breast what happens is they pierce the diaphragm and then naturally these lymphatics have a communication. So through that secondary spread of tumors from the breast can get deposited into the ovary. Apart from that, uh, ovarian cancer itself again is prone for cancer, ovarian carcinoma. So again more common in uh, uh, women above 45 years of age after uh, during their period of menopause or uh, post menopausal period then. What affects the young females in their reproductive age is the polycystic ovarian disease. So an ultrasonic uh, examination reveals the ovary with numerous fluid filled cysts and inside the cyst we have follicles but they are all immature follicles, they do not undergo maturation characterized by irregular periods. Then hormone levels might be disturbed, they might be altered and with the higher levels of androgen hormones. Okay, so polycystic ovarian disease one of the main cause for infertility in young women. Then ovarian torsion, so twisting of the ovary, ovary gets uh, twisted, characterized by pain, nausea and vomiting. So nausea and vomiting with pain in the lower abdomen uh, should be suspected for ovarian torsion. So it might actually because of this torsion the blood vessels might get cut off. If left uh, untreated then we have to lose the ovary. There might be many causes, some growth or carcinoma of the ovary or benign cyst might also lead to torsion or a very long ligaments. 
the suspensory ligament might also lead to the ovarian torsion. So that is about the ovary. Next, we are passing on to the uterus, the child-bearing organ or the womb. So our objectives for uterus will be a short introduction, followed by that where actually it is situated, then presenting parts and most the position of the uterus, which is the axis. So presenting parts, surfaces, borders, then blood supply, venous drainage, lymphatic drainage and most importantly the supports of the uterus. Factors which helps to maintain the uterus in its position and finally some clinical aspects we will be discussing with respect to the uterus. So as I told you it is a child bearing organ. So which bears the product of conceptus and helps the growth of the conceptus until it attains full maturation and it is capable of independent, ex uh, independent existence. So then the contents are expelled. So through labor at the end of the pregnancy period, the fetus is expelled. So very thick muscular organ and a hollow contains a uterine cavity. So hollow muscular organ roughly it is uh, pear shaped and flattened antero posteriorly. Okay. And uh, it expands enormously during pregnancy. Very thick musculature helps for the expansion. Um, up to ninth month it expands almost uh, it uh, occupies three-fourths of the abdominal cavity. So undergoes changes mainly during pregnancy as I told you. Now where actually it is situated again in the lesser pelvis behind the urinary bladder and in front of the rectum. So it is situated posterior to the urinary bladder but anterior to the rectum and the lateral angles receives the opening of uterine tubes. So the lateral angle is also called as the cornua. Cornua means horn as I told you. So posteriorly it is the rectum and anteriorly it is also resting on the urinary bladder. So receives the lateral angle, receives the uterine tube and communicates below to the exterior through the vaginal canal. Through the vaginal canal it communicates and the opening through which it communicates here, the lower most opening of the uterus is called as the external os. Os means nothing but an opening through which it communicates with the vaginal canal. If you look at the uterus, it is lying along the axis of plane of pelvic inlet plane of pelvic inlet okay so which is actually directed downwards and backwards pelvic inlet slopes downwards and forwards perpendicular to that inlet is the uterus is lying if you prolong it it will touch the umbilicus anteriorly and the middle of the sacrum so the uterus lies along the plane of pelvic inlet whereas the vaginal canal or the vagina lies along the plane of pelvic outlet. So coming to the presenting parts, it has got a fundus, then body and then the cervix. Three parts, fundus, body and cervix. So the upper convex part, slightly convex, is actually called as the fundus. So it is that part which is present above the openings of the uterine tube or above the lateral angle of the uterus. The upper bulged dome shaped part is actually called as the fundus. It is covered with peritoneum. Then, from the opening of the uterine tube to the cervix, 
So externally, internally you have the cervical canal, externally the cervix is marked by a constriction which is called as the isthmus. Anteriorly you see a short constriction between the junction of the body and the cervix and behind you see the torus uterine. So body is from the opening of the uterine tube below to the short constriction or isthmus. That cervix is actually from the internal os to the external os which is the cervical canal and it has got two parts. The part above the vagina is called as the supravaginal part and the part which projects into the vagina is actually called as the vaginal part of the cervix and it is a fixed part of the uterus. The most fixed part of the uterus is the cervix of the uterus. Now coming to the position, what is the normal position of the uterus? Very very important because it is this normal position which helps the uterus to stay in its place. Otherwise, because of this weight of the organ and the intra-abdominal pressure which is acting, the coils of intestine, everything, the uterus might actually slowly slip down, collapse through the vaginal canal. So, the uterus is mainly in an anti-verted and anti-flexed position. Anti-version is the angle between the cervix and the vagina. So the angle between the cervix and the vagina, this angle is the angle of anti-version which is 90 degrees, normal anti-version. Okay. So the rotation of the uterus with the vagina around a transverse axis is actually called as the anti-version 90 degrees. If there is a decrease in angle, if it becomes 70 or 60 degrees, it is actually called as retroversion. Okay, and a retroverted uterus is more prone for prolapse and it is also difficulty in bearing the conceptus. Antiflexion, if you look the cervix and the body, the body is more bent, bending, bent at a lower level compared to the cervix, that is called as antiflexion. The angle formed between the body and the cervix which is 120 degrees. So that is actually called as the anti-flexion. So both these positions provided the rectum and the bladder is empty. Okay. So the normal position is anti-version and anti-flexion. You should remember this. Normal angle of anti-version is actually 90 degrees. The reverse of anti-version is retroversion. Anti-flexion is 120 degrees is the angle between the body and the cervix of the uterus. If you look at the measurements, the length of the uterus is around 7.5 centimeters and maximum breadth will be around 5 centimeters and thickness is 2.5 centimeters. We will now discuss about the fundus of the uterus that is the presenting parts one by one. So the upper part, the fundus, completely covered by peritoneum, anteriorly, superiorly and posteriorly. Okay, And it is that part which is above the opening of the uterine tubes and does not bear the uterine cavity. So it does not form the uterine cavity fundus. Only from the body, the uterine cavity starts. Okay, so fundus covered by peritoneum, here you are able to see that covered by peritoneum and it is related to the superior surface of the bladder in front and between the fundus, next we see about the body of the uterus, it is flattened anterior posteriorly below the opening of the uterine tubes, above the opening this part is the fundus below the opening of the uterine tube, flattened anterior posteriorly. It has got a posterior surface, it has got an anterior surface and it has got two lateral bodies. Okay. And it contains the uterine cavity 
or the womb, the exact womb or the uterine cavity is present within the body of the uterus. So, these are the two surfaces and two borders. The anterior surface is covered with peritoneum. The anterior surface is covered with peritoneum and that peritoneum reflects on to the superior surface of the bladder and this is called as the rectovesicular pouch. Posterior surface also is covered by peritoneum and between the rectum and the posterior surface of the body what you see is the recto-uterine pouch or the pouch of Douglas, the most dependent part of the peritoneal cavity. So here very beautifully you can see the ovary lateral wall ovarian fossa so anteriorly and front external iliac vein posteriorly ureter internal iliac vessels then above obliterated umbilical artery So, body of the uterus, posterior surface it is facing upwards and also backwards. So, covers the peritoneum up in the posterior fornix of vagina. So, here are able to see the vagina forms folds or fornices. This is the posterior fornix. This is the anterior fornix. See the posterior fornix is extensive. There are two more fornices. On either side, here you will see the lateral fornix, this side and the other side. So, two lateral fornix and one anterior and one posterior fornix. So, totally there are four fornices. So, that is the recto uterine pouch, the boundaries of recto uterine pouch, lower part of the cervix and the posterior wall of the vagina, rectum posteriorly below. The floor of the pouch is formed by the rectovaginal fold of peritoneum. So, peritoneum extending from the posterior wall of the vagina to the rectum is actually called as the rectovaginal fold of peritoneum. And on either sides, you have the recto uterine folds, recto uterine folds on either sides. So, in front, you have the uterus, behind, you have the rectum. Floor is formed of the recto-vaginal fold of peritoneum and on either side by the recto-uterine folds. So, this part is related to the rectum, sigmoid colon, posterior surface of the body. Coming to the lateral borders, so that is the lateral borders of the uterus, it is receiving the attachment of the broad ligament. So, the broad ligament has got two layers which is attached to the lateral border of the uterus. Between the two layers, what you see uh, is the ovary uterine vessels on the lateral. You see the uterine vessels between the two layers of the broad ligament. Then this is the lateral cord wall. Three structures are attached. One is the uterine tube. In front, you have the round ligament of uterus. Behind and below, you have the ligament of ovary. So, ligament of ovary, you try and cube, and then this is your round ligament of uterus. So, these three things are attached to the lateral corn wall or the lateral angle of the uterus. Coming to the uterine cavity, so which is seen in the body, it is triangular in the coronal section. So, coronal section is you take it along a coronal plane, thereby dividing it into anterior half and a posterior half. So, it is triangular or coronal section. If you take a cross section, it will appear as a transverse slit, just a horizontal line. And of course, sagittal section, it appears as a longitudinal slit, which we have a vertical or a longitudinal slit, which we have seen in so many sections or pictures. Base of the uterine cavity is formed by the fundus. Apex is actually formed by the internal os that is the commencement of the cervical canal, internal os. 
through which it communicates with a cervical canal. Interior of the cavity is lined by endometrium. Okay. So, the internal lining is actually called as endometrium. So, and endometrium, uterine endometrium again has got different layers, stratum basal, stratum spongiosum, <coughs> different strata you have and uh, it is actually the functional part of the endometrium is shed off. It undergoes enlargement during the proliferative phase of the menstrual cycle and then due to the sudden uh, withdrawal of the progesterone what happens is this uh, functional part of it is the uterine endometrium is shed off. Okay. So, all those details is embryology which is makes the class even more lengthy. Then the thick myometrium deep to the endometrium made up of muscle layers, outer longitudinal, middle circular and inner layer is reticular. So, they form a reticulated pattern very thick uh, myometrium and then the outermost covering is the perimetrium, outer perimetrium. So, that is the wall of the uterus. So, cavity is lined by the endometrium. The endometrium of a pregnant uterus is actually called as decidua. So, you call the endometrium of the pregnant uterus as a decidua. Then again the decidua is given to decidua, parietalis, decidua, uh, basalis and so on. So, next coming to the body, we finished with the body of the uterus, coming to the cervix. So, here you are able to see on a sagittal section it appears like a vertical slit. Cervix is the most fixed part of the uterus. It has got two parts. One part is above the vagina, this part above the vagina is called the supravaginal part and then you have the vaginal part. Externally, the body and cervix can be separated. If you look carefully, you will see a short constriction, the isthmus. And the lower part of the cervix projects into the vagina and rests on the posterior vaginal wall. So, the supravaginal part is related to the base of the bladder in front and the rectouterine pouch behind. And on each side, you can see the ureter actually crossing in front of the uterine vessels. So, this part is actually the, you are able to see a small transition between the vaginal part and the supravaginal part. So, here you can see the ureter is actually crossing the uterine artery in front. So, on each side you have the ureter, then the uterine artery and then you have the back and rods ligament. So, these are all at the junction of the cervicovaginal junction you can call it as or the junction between the supravaginal part and the vaginal part. Okay. Back and rod ligaments from here will actually, they will fan out, expand and attach to the lateral wall of the pelvis. So, that I will be discussing in the supports of the uterus. Sometimes occasionally you see a lymph node here, paracervical nodes. So, enlargement of this lymph node indicates cervical carcinoma. Okay. Uh, so, just enlargement alone we cannot come to a conclusion as a carcinoma, but to be suspected. So, you have to further uh, confirm your diagnosis. So, the vaginal part, if you look at the vaginal part, the tip rests on the posterior wall and the anterior wall of the cervix is more extensive compared to the posterior wall because posterior wall is short because the posterior fornix of vagina goes to a higher level compared to the anterior fornix. So, the lower on the tip of the cervix it is represented by an external os and it is surrounded by anterior and posterior fornix and two lateral fornices of the vagina. So, here you are able to see the tip of the external os, the two lateral fornices you are seeing 
anterior posterior forbids which we have seen in this uh, picture. So that is how the, to this forbids the uterus actually projects into the vaginal cavity. So the length from internal loss to external loss is 2.5 centimeters in adult and this is 5 centimeters uterine cavity. So the ratio of the both the length is 1 is to 2. Body versus cervix length is 1 is to 2 that is 1 is cervical 2 is body or 2 is to 1 you can call it as but in children it is opposite the body the length of the cervix is 2 times more than compared to the length of the body of the cervix. So if you look at the shape of the cervical canal in a coronal section it appears fusy form and numerous longitudinal folds you can see from those folds you can see secondary folds called as palmate folds. So one fold will go and fit into the groove of the opposite fold and that is how the uterus is actually kept in a closed position and that is called as the arbor vitae pattern. So arbor vitae pattern is like the branching of the tree and it also contains some simple tubular glands and the infection of these glands produce a condition which is called as ovula neboti. Then supravaginal part and vaginal part it is totally different. Supravaginal part it is lined by columnar epithelium, simple columnar epithelium. But uh, in young children it might be ciliated columnar but in ciliated columnar it is lost after the onset of menarche. And, uh, it is uh, ciliated columnar epithelium and lower part it is lined by the vaginal part of the cervix is actually lined by the stratified squamous epithelium stratified squamous epithelium and the supravaginal part of the cervix including the internal cause is taken up by the uterine cavity in the late stage of pregnancy that is third trimester and it is called as lower uterine segment. But the fetal membranes do not get attached here that is your amnion and the chorion. These two fetal membranes do not get attached to this part of the cervix even though it is taken up by the lower uterine segment. Okay. So an epithelial transition takes place. So whenever there is an epithelial transition there is uh, more prone for carcinoma again uterine answers of the cervix okay so that i we will discuss in the applied aspects coming to the blood supply of the uterus mainly supplied by uterine artery so uterine artery branch of anterior division of the internal iliac artery so crosses the ureter at the lower border of the broad ligament then enters along the lateral border of the body of the uterus, it divides into anterior and posterior branches, then it gives arcuate arteries. These arteries they pierce the muscle of the uterus and they form radicular branches, radicular branches. The muscular branches are called as radicular branches. Then from there they give rise to the straight and the spiral arteries. These spiral arteries are the one which gets uh, ligated during the menstrual, during each uh, cycle of menstruation. They should be spiral in nature. Uh, if they are not spiral or straight then what happens is there will be again heavy amount of hemorrhage or uh, menstrual bleeding. So because these arteries are spiral immediately what happens is they get uh, closed after some time. So it is supplemented by ovarian artery also, uterine artery apart from that ovarian artery and vaginal artery also supplies some parts of the uterus. So veins corresponding veins corresponding to the arteries that drain into uterine, ovary and the vaginal plexus. 
lymphatics you see three plexus or nodes periglandular then within the muscle intramuscular and then subserous plexus more superficially to the subserous plexus they drain into lateral and uh, para aortic nodes pre and para aortic nodes upper part of the fundus and body upper part of the body the remaining part external iliac nodes lower part of the body then cornua and the adjoining part of the uterine tubes into the superficial inguinal nodes and uh, cervix into lateral sacral common iliac and external iliac nodes okay sympathetics t2 to l2 segments of the spinal cord from there through hypogastric and uterovaginal plexus they supply the uterine they are vasomotor and stimulate the myometrium so contractions of the myometrium parasympathetic s2 s3 s4 pelvis planktic nerves they are vasodilator and inhibit the uterine musculature okay so that is about the nerve supply of the uterus coming to the supports of the uterus there are two types of supports primary supports which you can call it as the true supports and you also have false supports so true supports are ligaments apart from the ligaments there are other factors also muscles mainly the true supports ligaments are mckendrott's ligament on either side running transversely on either side uterosacral ligaments running posteriorly and then in front you have the pubo cervical ligaments so these are all mainly the true ligaments and one more ligament is the round ligament so these four ligaments are the true supports for the uterus mckendrott's ligament is also called as transverse cervical ligament at the cervico vaginal junction it is attached and then like a fan shape it spreads and attaches to the lateral wall of the pelvis so it prevents the sagging of the uterus into the vagina so it is actually called as the cardinal ligament of uterus mckendrott's ligament also called as the transverse cervical ligament it is the cardinal ligament so by the traction on either side it helps to hold the uterus in its position so that is the mckendrott's ligament which you are able to see here like a fan shaped ligament attaches to the lateral pelvic wall uterosacral ligament pair ligaments again extend backwards and attaches to the ligament passes by the either side of the rectum so thereby what happens is it helps to maintain the anti version of the uterus so the backward pull helps the lower part of the uterus to rest on the posterior fornix of vagina so traction given backwards this is giving traction on either side pubo cervical ligaments are thin fibrous bands which is attaching to the posterior surface of the pubic bow and passing on either side of the bladder which is giving a traction anteriorly so all sides because the traction is given the uterus is prevented from sagging down or getting prolapsed then you have the round ligament the round ligament actually from the lateral angle passes through the inguinal canal gets attached to the labium majus so this is a round ligament maintains the anti flexion keep the forward bending of the body of the uterus okay so that is about the transverse cervical or mckendrott's utero sacral then you have the pubo cervical and then the round ligament of uterus they are all the two supports false ligaments they are nothing but the peritoneal folds so you have the uterovesicular fold 
running anteriorly the uterovesicular folds then you have the uterosacral folds or recto uterine folds which forms the lateral boundary for the recto uterine pouch so under these folds the uterosacral ligaments are running recto uterine folds then you have recto vaginal fold which forms the floor of the pouch of douglas or recto uterine pouch recto vaginal fold this is unpaired the single fold from the posterior fornix of vagina to the rectum okay so these are the false ligaments uterovesicular recto uterine and recto vaginal folds the next one is broad fan shaped ligament is a broad ligament of the uterus quadrilateral in outline divides the female true pelvis into an anterior compartment where the bladder is present and posterior compartment where the ovary and the rectum is present it's a double layered fold and uh, the layers upper border is free medial 3/4 has or invests the uterine tube okay upper border then lower border diverges and attaches to the pelvic wall diverges and attaches to the pelvic wall lateral border attaches to the lateral pelvic wall it has a posterior inferior surface and in the front you have the anterior superior surface so to the posterior inferior surface the ovary is related as i told you upper border is free medial 3/4 contains the fallopian tube or the uterine tube so lower border what happens is it diverges to attaches to the pelvic floor and what enters you ureter is related to the lower border uterine artery enters via the lower border So contents of the broad ligament, uterine tube, is the free border. Round ligament of uterus, ligament of ovary, ovarian vessels, uterine vessels, lymphatic nerves, and epipheron and paraepipheron are uh, remnants of the para uh, remnants of the paramesonephric tubules. All these you come across in the broad ligament. the broad ligament can also be divided into subdivisions this is mesometrium between the uterine tube and the uterus mesometrium between the uterine tube and the ovary mesosalpix and then you have the mesovarium so these are the three parts or subdivisions of the broad ligament so we have seen about the two supports and the false supports uh the other supports are mainly the levator and a muscle which forms the pelvic diaphragm especially the anterior part pubo vaginalis muscle they constrict the vaginal opening so thereby what happens is they prevent the uterus from collapsing into the vaginal canal the pelvic diaphragm levator and a muscle acts like a hammock okay so thereby what happens is it uh, restricts or it actually constricts the opening the lower opening then the position as i have discussed in the beginning itself anti vertered and anti flexion is mainly maintained by your uh, anti flexion is by the round ligament of the uterus and anti version is by the pubo uh, recto uh, uterosacral ligaments so anti flexion is maintained by round ligament and hammock action as i told you the fibers they actually converge and they form a hammock and not only that so traction created by the uterosacral transverse cervical pubo cervical this i already told you lateral anterior and posterior traction it is creating so thereby what happens is it is present in its place then pubo rectalis muscle pubo rectal sling what happens is it creates the flexion of rectum rectal flexure so because of the rectal flexure what happens is the posterior wall of the vagina rests 
on that. So again, it provides an indirect support. Same way, anti-flexed body of uterus rests on the superior surface of the bladder. Okay, this is the true ligaments giving traction in front, laterally, and behind. So anorectal flexion supports the cervix from behind. Fundus rests on the urinary bladder. And on either side, we have parametric tissue uh, like a loose packing material. So, thereby the uterus does not get uh, moved this side or that side. So, these are all the supports of the uterus. Coming to the clinical aspects, endometriosis. Now, uterine is lined by the endometrium. If this endometrium, uh, if at all it is present outside the uterus, in the pouch of Douglas or mostly seen on the ovaries, it creates a condition called as endometriosis or chocolate cyst. It is called as chocolate cyst because these endometriosis, these endometrial tissue outside the uterus also they bleed uh, during every menstrual cycle and uh, naturally those persons will be uh, experiencing tremendous pain, not only that. So, there is no way for this uh, uh, discharge, uh, this bleeding to get out. So, they get collected there and they might produce pelvic adhesions and they are all causes for the infertility. Then fibroids, they are benign tumors which is called as leomyoma. It might be deep to the endometrium, submucous or it might be intramural within the uh, muscle layer or subserial. So, it might be present at anywhere submucous, intramural, or subserial. They might be characterized by heavy menstrual bleeding. So, it may be more than 5 days and heavy loss of blood. You try fibroids. The fibroids has to be incised and removed. Otherwise, if it is not in a position to be removed, or there are many fibroids too large, then hysterectomy is the only next option. So, prolapse, sliding of the uterus or protruding of the uterus into the vaginal canal is actually called as the prolapse, the uterus is getting prolapsed. Mainly in multiparous women giving birth to, to many children or in increased intra-abdominal pressure, coughing, sneezing, lifting heavy weights um, and if the floor of the pelvis is weak due to trauma or some pelvic diseases or due to if it is not properly repaired in any pelvic uh, procedures, surgery or previous uh, during previous labor or something if there is an episiotomy which is done where the perineal body is incised. Perineal body is also called as gynecological perineum. So that I will discuss in detail in the perineum class. So, all these might lead to prolapse of the uterus. If the muscles they are not again properly uh, repaired, then carcinoma of the uterus most commonly is the cervical cancers. The predisposing condition is HPV, human papilloma virus. Uh, if it is infected with the human papilloma virus, then what happens? It might turn into cervical carcinoma. So, that is why pap smear is actually recommended especially for women above 40 years of age. So, hysterectomy is removal of the uterus mainly in case of fibroids or prolapsed uterus. The uterus is prolapsed too much or uterine carcinoma. So, you have to ligate the blood vessels very carefully. You do not ligate the ureter which is crossing the uterine vessels. Colposcopy is a procedure to view the interior through an instrument which is illuminated. So, there the cervix is mostly viewed and sometimes even a biopsy is taken. So, that is called as colposcopy. Caldoscopy or caldicentesis is a procedure where a nick is given on the posterior wall of the vagina and the recto uterine pouch is drained if there is any collection of fluid or blood to drain the 
recto uterine pouch or Douglas pouch it is called as Caldi synthesis. So finally we come to the uterine tubes fallopian tube it is called as ovary duct so transports the ovary and sperm because sperms ascend once it is deposited into the vaginal canal and it is ascending into the uterine tubes. Ovary is also transported and fertilization if at all takes place in the ampullary region. Once it is fertilized, then it takes the fertilized ovum to reach the cavity of the uterus 72 to 96 hours, 3 days. By that time it would have become a 16 stage modula ready for embedding in the uterine cavity. So the length is 10 centimeters. So, 4 inches and here again 4 inches on either side and then this breadth is 2 inches. So, totally it is 10 inches but the your pelvic cavity is 5 and half inches in females. So, how do you accommodate? So, that is why it is tortuous or bent. Parts Commencing part or one which is projects into the lateral angle of the uterus, the intramural part, very short part. Then followed by that you have the isthmus, the narrow part of the uterine cavity, sorry, narrow part of the uterine tube is the isthmus. Then you have the ampullary part, which is the dilated part, ampulla or dilated tortuous part where the fertilization takes place. Then the funnel shape the part is infundibulum, then which has the fimbriae or leaf like process and one of the fimbriae is very large called as the ovarian fimbriae. So the relations in the broad ligament it is related in front to the round ligament below and here to the ligament of ovary and below to the uterine vessels. Okay. So ligament of ovary, round ligament and below to the uterine vessels. Then it runs in respect to the ovary upwards, then backwards and then it turns downwards. So related to above, behind and medial surface of the ovary, the uterine tube. So mainly the uh, infundibulum part of the uterine tube. So it is supplied by uterine and ovarian arteries, veins, corresponding veins. So, lymphatic spree and paraiotic nodes, all these we have seen in ovary and uterus. So, there is nothing much to describe. Sympathetic is T10 to L2, parasympathetic lateral part vagus, whereas median part is pelvis plaquic nerves. Coming to the clinical aspects, inflammation is actually called as salpingitis. Inflammation of the uterine tube is actually called as salpingitis. Removal of the uterine tube is called as tubectomy. So, most commonly is because of the ectopic pregnancy, tubal pregnancy. Implantation takes place where uh, the fertilization takes place. So naturally what happens, there may be rupture of a tube with alarming hemorrhage, so it is a medical emergency. So you should be careful to rule out tubal pregnancy. So then uterine tubes has to be removed, uterine tubes is also removed in certain cases of pelvic inflammatory diseases or in tuberculosis, all those things. Now if one uterine tube is removed, then even with one uterine tube or fallopian tube, fertilization is possible because through transcelobic migration, the oocyte from here also can enter the opposite uterine tube. So family planning method is actually tubal ligation, mainly for family planning and uh, hystrosulfid geography, you see the patency of the tubes. So, a dye is injected and then we take a radiograph to see whether the dye is filling the uterine cavity and then the uterine tubes, the fibria, the dye is filled into the peritoneal cavity. 
So to mainly to check the patency of the tea feather, there is a block mainly collection of pus due to some infections or thickening of the musculature might also completely close or occlude the tubes if the tubes are blocked, tubal blockage, in tuberculosis also this happens. So to rule out you do an histosulfine yoga. So that is all for today and thank you very much for your patient listening.